My name is Michael Belcher. I'm a cinematographer. And I was in high school in 2000 when High Fidelity came out. It made an impression on me at that time as I was coming of age. Um, being a teenager, music and romance were on my mind every single day, as you might imagine. Napster was just becoming a thing online. I was dating my first serious girlfriend. It was an educational time for me, for sure. And High Fidelity dovetailed with that nicely. Watching the film now, after many years away from it, reminded me of the way in which the film was just embedded into my youth. It informed so many things during that time in my life. It's kind of wild. It's just one of those films for me, and I think for many people. Um, and it was great to revisit it and talk about it with Eva Michon. Eva Michon is a director from Canada, best known for her narrative and music video work. Her other interests include art and music, and she ran an interview magazine called Bad Day from 2009 to 2016, which gained a cult following among the art book fair punker crowds. Having spent the last decade in California, Michonne recently checked back into Canada, where she's currently working on a TV series and prepping her first feature film. I met Eva a few years ago when we worked on a pilot together. Uh, it was an unscripted show, a reality show, you might say, which was a a, a cool experience and a cool experiment for both of us, I think. Um, I'm very thankful to know her and very thankful to present you with this conversation. Thanks. When we first talked about doing this, uh, we talked about two films. Yeah. High Fidelity was not the first thing you mentioned. No, no, it was not because uh, one film I wish I made I mean, the first thing that pops into your head is just like a film you like, you know, or love or your favorite film. Um, but I don't think, yeah, it's like, I think my favorite film is The Vanishing, so the, the original, um, and that popped into my head. And that's like a film that, you know, I'd love to rip off in many ways. You know, I think what's it called, uh, Elephant Man came to mind, all that jazz came to mind. But I just, I think I said, I, I have no business making any of those films, you know, just because you enjoy something, I think. But why is that? You feel like it's outside of your like current skill set or just topics that you don't well, like relate all to in some way? Well, all that jazz, for example, I think you'd have to like live, it's, it's like autobiographical, you know, you'd have to live um, uh, Bob Fosse's life in order to make that, even conceive of that movie. It's kind of chicken and egg. So, and also I think if you, if a movie is perfect, why would you, it's sort of like, yeah, I guess you, I can get confused in the, uh, it's almost like, you know, if you love a, a song and you're a musician, I guess there's some songs you could just say like, man, that's such a good song. I wish I'd written that song. But then you can just go and cover that song. That's easy, right? If you like just want to experience the song, but you can't just like cover a film <laughs> that's really funny I never quite thought about it that way but that's really interesting to think about yeah you can just be kind of bitterly like oh, I wish I like in I think that the I think that the question is sort of I think your answer has to be sort of there has to be some like greed wrapped up in it you know there has to be something like greedy about it um but it, it come it should also come from a place of admiration so High Fidelity is not my favorite film, but it's, uh, I could see, <laughs> I could see myself, I think I admire it for a lot of reasons that align with my interests, my skills maybe, but most of all, it's just like, you know, I, I rewatched it obviously, and it's just done with such a taste level 
you know, it's about a music snob. So they couldn't, they couldn't mess that up. Like the music, the, the soundtrack is, is perfect. The way they talk about music, just all the details are done so well. And then the wardrobe, the setting, the fact that they set it in Chicago, it's not even narrated. It's just like, he's talking to you the whole time. And there's all kinds of weird, interesting things that, that, that Stephen Frears, I think, pulled off that I think is very masterful, actually, even though this is like a very pop movie. You know, I didn't want to choose also something that was too pretentious or something that was too, you know, jokey or like, uh, whatever, too unpretentious. I think it's like just perfectly in the middle. And it's also a comforting movie to me. So I, I, I can just like throw it on. I think the first time I saw it was on an airplane when I was 14 or 15. And for, I don't know if this is like the actual memory, but this is how my brain has cataloged this memory. I, my dad worked in Singapore for a couple of years and I went to visit him with my mom. And that's the flight where I saw that movie, I think. And so, I had already been into like punk for a while. I think I had like a Chelsea haircut and and then I just kept watching it for years. And so when I was watching it last night, I was I was saying the dialogue as as it was right before it played. But then it's also um such a poignant such a poignant piece about relationships and although we're with the main character the whole time he's he's totally flawed you know and has really ugly moments too but then a lot of the ugly stuff is is just handled so well with humor it's just like it's funny and dark at the same time cool and enjoyable and then, you know, leaves you with a little nugget of wisdom at the end of it. And that's all extremely difficult to do. Yeah, the control of tone in this thing is insane. It's insane how they've thread this needle between all those things you said. It's totally funny. It's totally dark. It's totally insightful and wise and totally silly. It's like, and somehow this thing holds together and has this I mean, it's like a person, right? It has all these different sides, but they all feel like they're coming from the same like core place. That it's it's a little bit mind boggling. Yeah. And are we allowed to talk about spoilers in it? Oh yeah, anything. Um, because you know, the there's the part where like Laura's dad dies and um Rob's like, you know, uh what's his name? Uh so there's Rob, Dick, and Barry um, who work in the store. And Rob's like, huh? And Barry's like, what? And he's like, Laura's dad died. And then Barry's like, oh, drag. <laughs> he keeps seeing the burrito. <laughs> and, then, and then Dick is like, I'm sorry, Rob. Like, they, it's like, I don't mm -hmm. know. There's so much, there's an incredible amount of, yeah, balance throughout the thing. One thing you touched on there um, that I feel like is crucial for this this film coming out in 2000. I think most people in our generation, you know, being a teenager, I, I was as well when I saw it. And at that time, really into music, discovering music. It's sort of, it's not pre-internet, but it's from, you know, where I, how I grew up, kind of pre-internet or access to information. Proto-internet, yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I was getting into music, but then it, just, it still felt mysterious. I didn't know where I was on the spectrum of interest and, and to see someone really deep down the rabbit hole of loving, loving music and seeing like bands on the wall. I'm like, oh, I love that band. Like, no, one never talks about that band. That's a picture of it. You know, there are all these other references that just kind of hooked me in and kind of validated some of my love of music and kind of emotional reliance on music at that time. And then seeing you know, also, you know, engaging in my first romantic relationships and seeing this main character talk about it with so much insight and wisdom and just sort of, uh, you know, just catastrophe as well. 
I feel like I learned, it affected the way that I thought about relationships and the way that I conducted relationships actually at that time. So you saw it when it first came out too? Yeah, I don't know if I saw it in the theaters, but I was in high school for sure. Yeah. I graduated high school in 2003. So I, I certainly saw it during my high school years. And um, yeah, I feel like, you know, the comfort you describe around it is, is very relatable. It is one of those films that just gets into a subculture of music and and then it just approaches relationships like head on. And it's like, I was, I was thinking about the plot and I'm like, wow, this plot is kind of, I don't, it's really simple, pretty straightforward. Yeah. It's not a whole lot to hang this thing on on paper besides this like emotional reflection. Um, and it's really yeah. interesting to see the film, you know, be so strong, but really have a scaffolding of mostly like emotional reflection on relationships. But it has a, you know, but it has a hook. I mean, it's it's really easy to say that the plot, you know, it's like, okay, guy's going through a breakup and while he's, you know, he's he's going, th breaking up with his girlfriend, he decides to revisit his ex-girlfriends, his former relationships to see what went wrong. You know, it's like, that's, that's a hook to me. It's like the plot is, it's, it's very pop. It's very, um, you know, it's like a mainstream, almost like a rom-com, you know? Yeah. Um, but then I, beca I think because it's based on a book that is dense and has so much in it, there's all the like little reflections that he has could be their own movie. You know, it's like, the part where he says like you know he he proposes to to Laura and he's like you know he ha he has has his monologue about the fantasy you know and um you know the fantasy is boring the fantasy isn't real I've thought about that a lot like after like that's part of like the the relationship um reflection right it's like mm -hmm. the girl who comes into his store and interviews him she could be a soulmate of his you know it's like he she works in she's a writer music writer it's like why wouldn't he pursue that like it's mm. and then also um oh another thing i wanted to talk about was the the mixtape you know like you could make probably a whole movie about that at that time um and i don't know you know that's just that's i don't know if young people would even understand what the fuck that's about i mean Maybe there's some kind of nostalgic, ironic, uh, maybe there will be some kind of like a mixtape movement or something like true cassette tape. But I used to make mixtapes, like I'm sure you did. Largely because of this film or this film influenced the way, like when you talked about the rules at the end, I have never made a mixtape that didn't start with uh, uh, something short and catchy something even harder and faster and then mellowing out. I've never made one that doesn't do that. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> it's well, you know, he did a real public service. When I first heard him say that it was a validation of not necessarily my own mixtapes, but like mixtapes my friends have made me that, that were really on point. I was like, oh yeah, that's what Nikki did for me. Or like, that's what someone else did for me. And then but, but the important thing is that at the end that he um, he makes her a mixtape of songs she would like, you know, that's like, that's how you know. It's amazing that that's how you know the character has changed. Like that, that, that is like my favorite kind of character change in a movie. It's like, it's not earth shattering, like, you know, it doesn't feel fake. It's like, it's a small shift. Agreed. <laughs> let's, let's talk a little bit about the opening. Okay. I'm I'm big on first shot, first thirty seconds of a, of any project. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious what you think about the first shot of the film, just the opening of the film in general. Um, it starts. I can tell you what it is. It starts with oh, a. Um, yeah. Yeah. It starts with the um, following his headphone cable. Yeah. Back to his head. Yeah. And then she comes in, he takes off his headphones after she pulls the plug out. Yeah. And we're on our way. Well, first he has a little moment to himself, right? He's like, what came first? Right. The misery. And um, yeah. 
so it's just so good and and it does my favorite thing in a movie which is it it opens how it finishes you know it, he closes off with a scene with his headphone putting his headphones on um but yeah at the beginning the opening shot it's just so great how like the song the song that starts it off is perfect he's just listening it's like when you think about him he just got dumped and he put headphones on and he's listening to music talking to himself and so she really like breaks him out of his world by just like unplugging the the cable and then they get back to breaking up it's like he left the breaking up process to go be miserable and then she like yanked him out of it mm. in terms of yeah but but the fact that he has his little like soliloquy before is just perfect and then she leaves and then he goes back you know into and and actually like I, i'm always shocked at how quickly the top five and the flashbacks happen like in mm -hmm. my head it's always uh or like it used to be when i think back on the film it's like oh i always thought that the break like all the previous relationships that they kind of come in way later but it's actually like in the first few minutes he's like in Allison Ashmore um you know the like the the primary school or middle school first relationship right mm. yeah it it feels weirdly like a play I and mean, maybe it's because he's breaking the fourth wall but there's just something about the sort of like flamboyance of style in that first opening scene and right back into the flashback so it just has a yeah a very theatrical feel but in a way that i find really palatable i usually when i'm saying theatrical it's not it's not a favorite thing yeah but this this really has a i don't know i don't know what it is that, that works so well even though it's it's doing things that don't normally work for me i think it might part of it is also cusack's charisma is just like off the charts during this time yeah, and he's really uh, he's really big, like his performance is really big, and I don't know if it's the right word, but I'm gonna use it. I think he's kind of bombastic in this movie, and like all the swearing is is really also like perfect when he swears, like, um, and he's also like a, he's. Um, He's kind of a brat as well like he's kind of a like a baby having a temper tantrum in a lot of it you know like when he's breaking up with charlie and he's like charlie you fucking bitch let's work it out <laughs> <laughs> i love that line it's too good no it's like the whole thing um he's just really the the only person who could have played this role is just perf so perfect 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 in every way i think about the ending. Oh, about the ending. Um, I mean, there is there is kind of a remarkably successful musical performance that I think is very rarely pulled off mm, with yeah. as much as much for me at least real joy and like yeah, it's a real it's it's a real like commercial film moment for me where I'm just like feeling so good to feel good, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the characters too are are surprised to feel right. to like it too, right? Because it's like Jack Black, um, Sonic Death Monkey, um, but but that night they were Barry Jive in the Uptown Five, um, <laughs> and they just do that. I mean, yeah, it's like again just just the i mean we got to just talk about how perfect the cast it, like the movie is 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 cast to perfection and so much of like those the the thing like the the performance at the end i'm not sure who else could have done that than besides you know jack black was doing um tenacious d at that time I think he played the after he played the after party. I think Tenacious D played the after party for this movie when it first came out. Mm. Um, so it's like 
yeah, this performance, they do the performance and then it kind of uh, eases into a quiet scene of Rob at home, right? Which, which bookends the film and and he's doing this, this mixtape and uh, Stevie Wonder comes on. And so another thing is that um, I'm like not the biggest fan of Stevie Wonder. And um, in fact, I'm not such a fan, period. <laughs> I like some of, I've been, I've warmed up over the years to like some of his stuff. Um, but I also, I just love that there's like so much shade thrown at Stevie Wonder in the movie, you know, like, like Barry's like talking about his like, um, uh, can a formerly great artist be redeemed by, for, yeah, yeah for his latter day sins. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but then, you know, but like, you can't deny some of his songs and that the fact that they end the song with like, a Stevie Wonder song for Laura. Um, mm, yeah. Musical opportunities are often missed in films or um, not used to their full potential. But I think in this movie, every every opportunity is um, is just like exceptionally used and executed and and I think that that's just like telling of the people behind it um being absolute music nerds and appreciating how much meaning you know a, that choice can have it seems I think what you're saying is that 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 choice of Rob choosing that song shows us that he is having this evolution of his own personal character to include a song that might not be his favorite, but that he thinks Laura will like. Yes. The yeah. soundtrack, the music in the movie is actually a, a character. I wanna ask you about a detail in the film. If there's one that comes to mind that you feel like you wanna talk about or draw attention to, could be like a line of dialogue or just something that sticks out as a, a moment, a shot little piece of blocking or camera move or something that um, you know, stuck in your mind for one reason or another? Um, let me think. There definitely is. The one that comes to mind for me is um, when Tim Robbins comes into the, when Ian Raymond comes into the shop and there's that sort of confrontation. He plays out a couple different versions of what he might do. <laughs> and that one where Dick grabs the phone and like knocks his teeth out. <laughs> As a teenage boy, I mean, I just, yeah, like that, that moment was, was a favorite moment just to see, it was so, it felt so good to see this fantasy of, of Dick, like having this kind of heroic or, um, you know, uh, very masculine moment for someone who feels like they're having a hard time with, <laughs> with that kind of balance. Yeah. Uh, that whole sequence is, is amazing. Um, and also, I think each one of those fantasies is a reference to a film. There's so much, so much going on in that whole scene. And one of my favorite moments is when, okay, I think you could actually teach a, like an entire class, like a three hour class, if you're a film professor on just that scene, because mm. he like walks out and then the way like the blocking is so good the way that they cut first they cut to you know they cut to Barry looking at at Rob and then he's like I've stopped all that now and then Ian's like you were there this morning and then they cut to Dick and his eyes his head face isn't his head doesn't move he just go his just his eyes move you know it's like it's so good and then he's like you know he says everything that would just piss you off so much in that moment. And he's like, you know, Laura's very special and I would hate it if I lost her. Um, and then his beeper goes off and then he looks down and he's like, guess who? <laughs> and it's just, and then you just see Rob fuming. And so the fantasies are, there's three, right? There's one where, where he's like, 
get your patchouli stink out of my store. And then there's the phone. And then there's the, actually, no way. Does it mean they hold them back? That's the second one. Yeah. And the second one, they hold them back. The third one, it's the phone. And then his teeth go flying, right? Right. right. And then he, then they take him down, they're kicking him. And then the, the AC. <laughs> And the music for each one is like super different. Like each one of the fantasies, mm. I think, is like slightly different. Um, so that whole scene, I also love. I also love the Ian fantasy. I love the. Um, actually, Ian I making love to you in my head. Yeah, yeah. He's like, um, you know, no, no, no woman is having better sex than. Um, the sex that you're having with Ian in my head or whatever it is. And the way that that actually, I think all of the, all of Rob's fantasies are just really, really enjoyable. Um, That one's really great. The Bruce Springsteen moment, of course, is just so nice. Um, And then I, yeah, I think actually the thing about the, they really like all, all of the um, detestable characters are so fun to watch. Like the Charlie, all the Charlie stuff. Like um, that's one of my favorite things uh, in the movie actually is when he realizes that she's awful because I think we all know people who, or have, had, have known at least one person that you just like idolize or you think they're so great maybe when you're young and then you get a chance to see them again and you're kind of like oh they're just they're just awful they're terrible because of something they say or whatever that just like a light goes Mm -hmm. off your head and you're like oh I've just been sort of like charmed by this person or whatever it is I'm so happy you mentioned that that is also watching I yeah kind of blew by me I think when I was younger but watching it yeah just now that 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 was hit me like a ton of bricks actually in the same way you're describing so I yeah I really second that yeah and I think it's more enjoyable when you watch it after that you know when you keep watching it you you really appreciate what um Catherine Zeta Jones is doing and you just feel really good that Rob finally noticed that you know do you see any influence on your work or on your personal life? And I was saying how it was one of the one of the pieces of art that um, you know just helped me think about relationships in a certain way. Um, and I don't think it's really had that much of an influence on my work. I wouldn't say. But I'm curious if this has moved you in those ways. But it's hard to say because I I don't think I've ever made anything that's like it. You know, I, I would like to, and maybe that's why I chose it, you know, because it has everything. It's kind of a dream. It would be kind of a dream movie if you could make it and pull it off because it's funny, as we said, it's romantic, it's dark. And it's also like incredibly like a really big budget, like Hollywood movie, you know, so to get all of for it to like hit all those nails on the head is quite amazing. And that it still has lasting power, right? Um, it probably it probably had an influence. Yeah, I think it probably had more of an influence in my life than in my work um, that I can track. Um, and it's just sort of like some of the lines in the movie, they just stick in your head. Yeah, something about being like I was saying, just the age that we were when we saw it, that yeah, the kind of things you take in just during those kind of adolescent years. Um, yeah, they make waves. Yeah, definitely. I love that the 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 like shithead skaters band is called the Kinky Wizards and that their album is I Sold My Mom's Wheelchair. Um, I think, yeah, what you're pointing to, to me, which feels like the thing this film is doing that very other films do that are somewhat larger budget or just mainstream, um, like a rom-com, is that there's a, is such a commitment to subculture. 
Yeah. Like they really go there. There are references in there that I still don't know. Yeah. You know, that they allow they allow things to not be understood by the general audience while they're making a rom com. It's a it's a it's a dichotomy that I, I don't know where I don't know where else I would point to as another example actually. Yeah, I think um, I think. I think that's telling of the people who made it. I think they were really devoted to, to um, I guess, authenticity in that way and also being true to the, the book, right? Because it's, I mean, really what we're talking about is a book that was put on screen and all of the, all of, I assume that all of the lines we're talking about and all of these things, all these nuggets of wisdom are just actually from the book. So it's like, it's a really, um, it's a really just exceptionally executed um, adaptation of a book. Is there some criticism you have? Is there, do you have things you, you wish you, you, you would change if you could in the film? Things you, um, yeah that you would uh, criticize? Yeah. Um, it's funny, I probably do, but it's like, when you watch something so many times, you just can't, like, there's like some awkward acting that I still notice um, that I would change. <laughs> yeah, so I would change, there's this moment where Laura's at the wake for her father and mm. Rob goes up to her to apologize and it cuts to Laura turned away and she gets condolences from two people, an old guy and a young woman. And both of those actors are so terrible to me. And I can't, and I, like the way he goes in to kiss her is really weird. Like everything. It's the way him. he looks at her afterwards, actually. He's got this really kind of strange, creepy look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, he goes, he like telegraphs that he, where he's going in. And like, um, so I would absolutely reshoot that scene. Um, and then I think that there's like a bit of awkwardness with the scene with the skater guys. Um, the acting uh, at the end where he offers to put them on the record label. Oh, also, I just love the scene where, where the guy comes in off the street to for uh, Barry's ad. Um, yeah, okay, this is back to your other question about a detail. Hmm. I really love um, what Jack Black does when the guy's like, yeah, so we can just jam. And he's like, cool. And then he like goes to fist pump him and he kind of does this. And then his elbow slides off the counter for just like a split second. That is like so, so important. Mm. Um, what Jack Black did there. And then the guy walks away, and does like that, but he doesn't turn around. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's just so much. And I mean, again, I feel like, uh, you know, now I kind of wish I had read the book in some ways, but uh, because then I could say, you know, what's in the book and what was, you know, what wasn't. So I don't actually know how much of it was actually, you know, pulled from, from the text, but it doesn't matter. Right. It's like, it's, it completely stands on its own um so maybe i'll never know i always wonder the, the one character that feels a little bit too theatrical to me is the tim robbins character i mean in the fantasy i think it's working great right because that's yeah. a fantasy but even in real life it still feels like just a little a little too pushed to uh to character and, yeah and every piece and you know performance in some spots but also wardrobe you know props and stuff around the house it's just i mean i get it it's like they're, they're doing that thing but i think they could have reeled it in just a couple of degrees and just grounded the character a little bit more and it um it wouldn't have hurt anything yeah i hear you on that 
yeah, he's like, um, he would have still been infuriating, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But more, you know, just, yeah, I think it, it, it hurts a little bit of the integrity of the emotions of the film because to me, this film is, is working on me because of the emotional coherence of it, the emotional logic of these characters and this character arc. That's what I, that's what keeps me watching it. And there's something about this character being too much of a like straw man that, um, yeah, I think it weakens it a little bit. Hmm. I think it'd be stronger if he was a little bit more strong. I, uh, I love the character, um, but I will agree with you only for one reason. And that reason is that I don't actually believe that Laura would fall for that guy right. if he was just a total douchebag. Right. And she's cool. Um, so in that way, I do agree with you. It's like, I, I enjoy watching it so much that I don't really think about it. But yeah, it would make it a, a little more realistic if... Um, you know, well, if you could recast it with uh, any, you know, actor from 1999, who would it be? You mm. know, age, uh, you know, what was Tim Robbins back then? Like 45 or, or so? I think I, I think it could easily be Tim. I, I love his stature. You know, he's a, he's a big guy with like kind of a handsome baby face. You know, I, I think he, he, you know, aesthetically looks looks great to me for that for that part. I think yeah, just dial the performance down a little bit and and rein in the 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 set dressing and uh, look. I don't think you can get Tim bit. Robbins to to dial it back. I think Tim Robbins shows up and does what Tim Robbins wants to do. So you're gonna have to yeah. re recast it. Maybe, maybe, yeah. No one comes to mind, but just that's one of those things that I'm like mm, a little bit too far in that direction. And also interesting watching. I didn't know that Seamus McGarvey shot it. Um, and considering what a master he's become, you know, maybe one of the, the greatest lighting cameraman to ever live, certainly yeah. living. Would you tell me a bit about him? I, I, did, I did know this, but I don't remember. Um, and I looked it up last night too. But tell me about him. So, right, so Seamus McGarvey. <clears throat> he's <laughs> he's had a wild a wild career um but if you saw anna karenina um the 2012 version yeah i did actually i don't there just aren't that many films that are as beautiful as that ever it's one of the most beautiful films to not win an oscar for, for cinematography outside of you know that and jesse james come to mind but yeah he you know for my taste i think he's one of the best dps when it comes to lighting, you know, um, his ability to light faces and spaces is incredibly graceful. And this is a film that is really conventional. It's like stylistically, outside of a couple of interesting camera moves, um, it's easy to miss. Um, and I, I did miss it actually. Um, I didn't realize until the end that he shot it and I, w I certainly wouldn't have guessed it. I mean, it's. A little bit earlier in his career so he's you know coming into his own still but um but yeah that, would, that surprised me is there anything in the film that stood out to you visually like um in terms of in terms of the cinematography the way faces are modeled is like a playbook for how to support performance um i feel like he saves the most beautiful and elegant lighting for the most beautiful elegant kind of romantic scenes like when he's sitting down waiting for her to have the, the conversation about asking her to marry him yeah um like that 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 back and forth yeah it's all like kind of side but backlit from that window kind of yeah heavy. yeah she's got a little rim and it's something sharp coming across her her blouse there um or her blazer but there's a little bit coming off the um, off the table, and just a beautiful wrap on her, and just the the ratios there are just they're just kind of sparkly and 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 poppy in a way that I think is just re you really feel like this heart 
heart opening sensation is is easier with that lighting for me and then yeah thinking about just yeah you know what the most beautiful scene to me is is when they're in the car um right before where she like picks him up and then they go and park and then it's just like the close-ups of them and it's just like they're just like wrapped in darkness their faces um before they have sex um it it really shocked me last night while i was watching it i was like it looked like a suddenly looked like a really old movie or something mm, yeah 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 kind of hard but graceful mm -hmm. what do you and i don't even know you know what the the source is probably like you feel like it's a a street lamp or something somehow uh now that i think about it because they like park under a tree or something anyway uh, but it doesn't it doesn't feel unnatural or anything and it's a very um moving moment in the movie i think too yeah yeah agreed and there's that just the way that his face is lit in the final little monologue mm. you know it's mostly frontal soft and it, it just feels open it feels like um a loosening of something tight relaxing and peaceful um, which feels like where he's at so yeah yeah a couple of, a couple of good things last question if you could ask Stephen Fears one question about high fidelity or about filmmaking in general what might you ask probably I would have really um, a really insightful great question if I had read the book and I could say, you know, why did you leave this out? Or what made you keep this, but not this, you know? Um, I would probably ask him a question about adapting, adapting a book. <laughs>